examined the ancient climate and migration patterns in Africa. Currently, Professor Ampin is tenured is a tenured professor of history at Contra Costa College in San Pablo, California, in the East Bay. And he also teaches um, in the African American Studies Department at Merritt College in Oakland. Uh, he also created a seven-step primary research methodology home study course at Advancing the Research. His latest work is the formation of the Save Nubia Project, which aims to help preserve the archaeological sites of ancient Kush and Nubia in the Sudan, which are threatened by the construction of dams. Um, anything else that I was remiss in saying, Professor Ampin, I'm sure it will um, <laughs> let you know. <laughs> Without further ado, please welcome Professor Ampin. How's everybody? Okay, good to see you all. Everybody was nice and quiet and patient and whispering and <laughs> or on their laptops. So I like it. I like that's what I tell my students. When you come in, you should be focused on something constructive rather than talking about the news of the day. Anyway, good to see you all. I have the pleasure of uh, really sharing with you the fruits of my primary research over the last quarter century. I want to thank Imani for her effort to help uh, bring everyone together and Dwayne for really informing people about uh, African civilizations, because most times people are only focused on this topic when, generally when, what time of year? In February. What I say as a historian is that we really should focus on it 366 days a year because it is that much information to, uh, that has to be shared. So I'm going to just kind of focus uh, on math and science and some of the African contributions because they don't get discussed very often. And I teach at Contra Costa College and we have people and in the scientific areas, and they, uh, more often than not, not always, more often than not, they overlook Africa. They look at the history of engineering or math or science. I just find it strange because I've gone to so many countries around the world to do first-hand research. I've gone to institutions, libraries, and museums throughout the U.S., Canada, Europe, and I find the complete opposite of what's taught in the classroom is that Africans have made a uh, tremendous contribution to technology and many other fields. So that's really what I'm going to focus on today. In our Save Nubia project, uh, I'll, I have a brochure I'll, I'll pass around, but this is the fruits of some of my research in Sudan, in Egypt, uh, and Ethiopia, where you have uh, classical African civilizations now, uh, mainly ancient Kush and Nubia, that are under threat. But, um, but since we don't have a lot of time, I just uh, will move forward. Uh, anybody know who this, uh, why this individual is important? Dr. Carter G. Woodson? What is his role? What is his contribution? Why would I want to dedicate this presentation to Dr. Woodson? Okay, let me help you out. He's a founder of what we now call African Heritage Month or Black History Month. He founded what was then called Negro History Week in 1926 because he said that the contributions of, of by people of African descent really is a, is a part of U.S. history and world history, and that these are the missing pages. And Dr. Woodson thought back in 1926 that it would mean a lot if we included these pages back into the historical text. And he's one of the greatest historians uh, of our time. He's done quite a lot. I mean, he wrote more than a, a, um, a dozen books, uh, uh, Dr. Woodson. His organization, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, founded in 1915 is still the leading African-American historical organization in the country. And every year they have a, 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 a annual uh, um, um, convention. And the Journal of Negro History has been updated now. It's the Journal of African-American History. It's the leading journal in the country. So we all went to uh, quite a lot. And uh, so we founded the occasion more than 88 uh, years ago. And there was a stamp in his honor and uh, one of his classic books, he wrote more than a dozen of the miseducation of the Negro, and he really focuses on the American educational system that really leaves out students of uh, color, uh, in particular uh, people of African descent, from their own uh, contributions to the world. And so he's one of the great historians of our time, so now you all know the great Dr. Woodson. Now moving forward, um, slow. Uh, I want to focus on Northeast Africa and contributions mainly from uh, from ancient Egypt. 
And as you can see, this is a map of Africa. And I was there last year. And I can assure you that Egypt did not detach itself from Africa and float off to the Middle East. I, I double-checked, I triple-checked. When I was in Egypt, I was on African soil. So it's still a part of the African continent even uh, today, even though it's not really taught that way. So this is the area here. So I've done research in different parts of the world, but today I'll focus mainly on Egypt. But a lot of my work on classical Africa has been in the Northeast African corridor. And so um, the three classical African civilizations are Kush, Nubia, and Kemet. People know Kemet as Egypt, but this is the Greek word. And there's no reason really to use Greek words because we know the original word from the hieroglyphic text. So we use the word classical because it's more important to use that than ancient. We hear about classical music, classical what? Classical theater, classical dance, classical art. So what does classical mean? Why would I put emphasis on classical and not simply ancient? Even though ancient civilization, African civilization would be technically correct, but what about classical? What does the term actually mean? Because we do hear, we use it, we read about it. Anybody? Yes, sir? It means it's the test of time. It's the? It stood the test of time. So the test of time, you're correct. I like that. Anybody else? Is that, yes, sir? It's still irrelevant. Still relevant? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you both are correct. So when we say classical, we mean anything that's the standard, the model, the guide, the highest rank, the highest class. As you said, you're correct. Anything that has permanent and lasting, and lasting value. That's what's meant by classical. That's why we call these classical uh, African civilizations. And uh, the oldest of them is Kush. This is a map of Kush. Kush uh, is the area of Northeast Africa, but not only Northeast Africa, but across the Red Sea into Saudi Arabia and Yemen. All of this was a part of the ancient Kushite empire. You can see it here in the inset. That's the area, that's the oldest of these civilizations. And, um, and Kush was based in modern day Sudan. That's why I spend a lot of time in the area. And this is the area where there's massive pyramids and elaborate temples and great writing and science. And so most people are not aware that there's twice as many pyramids in Sudan as there is in Egypt. The civilization spread from south to north, not the other way around. And so that's why I've done extensive first-hand research in order to document this. This is one statue made out of granite, one of the powerful Kushite kings. Isn't it? Can you imagine standing under a 30-foot statue made by one of the most powerful rulers of the time? So this is why I spend so much time, because the public in general is not too familiar with these powerful Kushite rulers. Uh, this is a 2,800-year-old uh, statue here. And then also, some of you possibly could have seen this image. Here, sometimes people have it on posters or a handbag. If you go to the uh, to the Ashley flea, flea Market in Berkeley, I've seen this sometimes on T-shirts. But these are Kushite princes, and this is a this is a 3,500-year-old uh, mural or drawing. And we know that they're a high stature. Notice the crowns on their head. Notice the almond-shaped eyes. Notice the skin variation. Here it says in the glyphs it says Kush, so we know where they're from. Notice the nice jewelry, the sandals. Here you have the uh, attendant assisting. And here you have an assistant with his arms outstretched. He has something draped over this arm. What do you think this might be that's draped over his arm here? Okay, it's an animal. Yes, it's a leopard skin outfit worn by priests and kings. For what purpose? I'm glad you asked. For the purpose of ritual and ceremony. And then the same assistant is carrying, you see, three rings here and another three. And so three indicates plurality. When something is, is plural or in abundance, you see three. So it means there's a lot of whatever this is. Anybody have an idea what this would be? What is the assistant carrying? A whole lot of scroll. Uh, okay, uh, a good try. Not exactly. Something a little bit more hard. And gold. Okay, gold. And there's currently, right now, 2014, there's actually a gold rush in Sudan now, literally. There's gold everywhere. In fact, the word Nubia, the root nu or nub, it means gold. So Nubia, more likely than not, means the land of gold. And, and now when you go to Sudan, there's people panning for gold everywhere, literally. So anyway, uh, if we had time, we would talk about that. But really today, uh, I want to 
really talk about the third of these classical African civilizations, which is actually uh, listed on the glyphs here. So let me point out what glyphs I'm referring to, and these glyphs here. And this spells Hemet, or so-called ancient Egypt. So this is what uh, do you think? So I'll, yes, it represents the M sound, and this is a burnt piece of charcoal. This is a half a loaf of bread. And this is a crossroad, it's where it's a locale where people live. This is the actual name. So there's no such name as Egypt until the Greeks come along much later. So many of the African countries, uh, these are not original African names. So I uh, just wanted to point that out. And um, all right, so let's focus on uh, writing before we deal with more of the, the hard sciences here. Uh, African contributions in the field of writing. You know, most of us. Uh, Okay, so uh, most of us are not always necessarily familiar with the source of what we have in front of us on a regular basis, paper. So this is actual papyrus plant. It grows in marshes, so they would take the papyrus plant and then they would cut it into strips and then they would eventually make paper. So from papyrus we get the word paper and this is an important contribution. This is some of the writing, the text here. You always read the text from top to bottom. This is text inside a pyramid, so people call it pyramid text. And even without ever studying the language, I bet that most of you can figure out some of these images without ever having taken any class or seminar or training. So, for example, um, this here is uh, the Shinu, or what people now call a cartouche. It's the ring of eternity. It's the name of the king you see uh, inside of here. But what is this symbol here? You see, uh, this is not the best resolution, but it's kind of pixelated here, but I guess you can s you see the ears? Rabbit. Okay, this is a rabbit. This is a ripple of water. Anyway, this is the king's name. What about this? Bird. It's a bird, yes. An owl, yes. This is a, this is a chick. This is, uh, you see this here? Um its outstretched arm. So if you, if I said to you, uh, where is the place of Memphis in Egypt? And you say, I don't know. This means not to know something. And uh, But you can make these out. So we would just have to give you training on what the, the, the value, the sound value is, but you can actually make out some of the images without taking a class. But anyway, so I wanted to show you some of these. And this is scribal equipment that uh, is there. This is a scribe's palette. And I'm showing this to you because I'm going to show you the first writer in the history of the world. And these are actual scribes here with their, their writing utensil, their board. This is the scribe's equipment. And uh, so what they have in their hand is this palette here. And so you see this everywhere in Egypt or Kemet. And uh, here's another palette, different colors. The two main colors were always black and red. This man here is a scribe. He's a writer. Uh, is, does anybody see any indication of him being a writer or a scribe? There's actually three things that indicate his profession. Okay, great observation you said that. Okay, very good. This is actually a scroll. You see it's rolled up here. So he's using his kilt, not a dress, but he's using his kilt He's pulling it tight, his kilt, in order to use that as kind of a writing surface. You know, like uh, when we write, we usually want something kind of hard. And then in his hand, what's broken off is the reed pen that he would have been writing. This is the scroll. Here's another indication of the fact that he is, in fact, a scribe. This is a scribe's palette. This would have been black and red. So we know his profession by the symbols, but also the glyphs tell us his profession as well. And... Here's, here you can see black and red. This is actual paintings. Here is a, a uh, this is a, a, a stone surface. But if you notice that on the left, it's darker than on the right. Do you see that? Any idea why? It would be two different colors. You might say maybe one was exposed to the sun. Uh, no, not that one. But notice that this one here has still has the horizontal lines. So this is an unfinished piece. It's not finished. It's a trial piece. But it still is, interestingly, it's two different colors. Here's why. This is the image that was uh, drawn by the master. And to the right is what the students were practicing on. Notice that they were practicing an arm and, 
in the hand. Notice this one here. It almost looks like the thumb is broke. The student did the best he could or, <laughs> or she could, but so they were practicing an arm and a hand. You see here, they're practicing. This is the quail chick. And so why is this lighter? Because when students practice, sometimes they have to what? Erase. So that's what they're doing here. They're practicing and erasing. But the master, he's not, not erasing. Erasing. Now, this is a science, by the way. This is science. You have a king sitting on his throne. We know that because of the scepter uh, here in his hand and the mace, the, the royal beard. His name is in the shinu. But not only that, but what we have here is the, the science as it uh, is seen by the modern uh, viewer. So that's from the, from, the, from the sole of the feet to the hairline when they're seated is always 14. Not sometimes, not most of the times, but all, always. So they can make a small trial piece into a colossal statue and then it's built to absolute perfection. So if you count, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and then 14 at the hairline. If this was a standing figure, it would be 18. There's no variation when this is done by royal artists who are trained by the states. So we all know rules, regulations, procedures. They believe that this was divine art given to them by the creator. So there's no such thing as artistic license. You must follow the, the rules. Anyway, so let me move forward and show you um, the writer of the very first book in the history of the world. I didn't say one of, the author of the very first book. This is Patahotep. And he was a prime minister, a high priest. And by the way, no one could hold high office like a prime minister, which is similar to our vice president. He's second in line to only the pharaoh, unless the person was a priest or priest, priestess. So they had to be a spiritual practitioner first. He's the author of the world's first book. So this is an image of Patahotep. Here he is. This is about 2400 BCE or before the common era. And this is Patahotep inside of his tomb. And this is his tomb here. Uh, here's a uh, close-up of uh, his tomb. So um, 2400 B.C., that's the same as 4400 years ago. And Patal Tep wrote the first book in the history of humanity. This is it. Uh, it's part of the text. So this is cursive. So when they wanted to write fast, just like we do, we write in cursive. So they didn't always write in glyphs. They wrote in glyphs if it was... Is something on temple walls. So what, is, what does this contain? 37 lessons on ethical or moral conduct. So the first book ever written in the history of humanity had nothing to do with fighting, warfare, or conflict. It's quite the opposite. Presenting moral and ethical conduct and social wisdom of how to avoid conflict, how to avoid social problems, how to show respect for elders. So now we have the two main colors. We have black and red. What do you think that you see intermittent red here? Why would the author, Patahotep, used red at different places in his text. And by the way, this is a text used in the school system. We know that because there's different um, versions of this text found throughout Egypt. So clearly this was what young boys and girls would have learned. Yeah, girls wrote as well, and they were taught. Red represents a different lesson. So whenever you see red text, you see if it's a medical document, it's a new case, if it's a mathematical document, it's a new problem. But in this case, it's moral lessons taught, so it's a new chapter. And that's what we have here. So this is the first book ever written. Um, these are the instructions of Patalotep if we type them out. And it says the wisdom or the maxim of Patalotep. And it says his title as a, uh, as a, uh, as a so-called prime minister. But anyway, this is um, some of the text of Patalotep in the second stanza. He's talking about leadership and that all leaders must have character. Character means to build. You know, and today in our country, a person can be <laughs> almost an outlaw, a former outlaw, and be a leader later on. Not so much the case in classical Africa. One must first have character, and everything was based on ma'at, truth, justice, and righteousness. It's, everything was bound by ma'at. So if we had more time, I would focus on it more, but I just want to show you some of what he talked about, leadership. Notice Patel, Sep, Sep, Patep, uh, he says, do great things which will, will be remembered long after you. So it's your reputation that Patel Tep is discussing. And not only that, but he also um, mentions, as all of the wisdom text discusses, and that is hearing well. You know, the most commonly used verb in classical Africa is the word or the verb sejum. Sejum means to hear 
or to listen. So it's always wisdom text regarding hearing well. And this is what he says. If, you, if a son and daughter accept the righteous teaching of their parents, none of their plans will go wrong. Teach your children then to be those that hear well, and they will be valued by those of weight and substance, and their speech will be informed by what they have heard. Respected are those that listen well. So think about it. We have two ears, two eyes, but how many mouths? Just one. So Patal Tep reminds us of how we should communicate. Some people don't listen as well as they should, and that's why they put great emphasis on listening. And uh, so that's why you have this as the most commonly used verb. Anyway, so that's uh, writing, but I really want to focus more on math here and the, and the other sciences since we are at Google and you all deal with a lot of technology. Well, here's the eye of Haru or Horus. And by the way, if you see words like Horus, some of you might know Isis, these names. If it ends in I-S, U-S, O-S, more likely than not, it is taken on as Grecian form. The original uh, words would have ended in other, you know, other uh, letters. But O-S, U-S, I-S, usually the Grecian form. So the Greeks couldn't really pronounce the words, so they did the best they could. So you have the all-seeing eye of Haru and different capacities. Here's a nice, beautiful bracelet, and this is the, the eye. They call it the wajet eye or the sound eye. It has to do with medicine, but also mathematics. So every aspect of the eye, the eyelash, and every aspect of the eye represents a fraction. And if you added up these fractions, it would be 63, 64. So we believe that this uh, symbol that you see everywhere in Kemet is also the RX symbol that's used today in pharmacy. And there's many things that we can point to to go back to this, this area because it's also a medical symbol as well. It's called the sound eye because uh, in the mythology, Haru loses his eye. And through magic, Jehuti uh, restores the eye of Haru, and so it's also called the sound eye. And so anyway, but we believe that this RX symbol goes back to that. But anyway, here's the, the eye of Haru. This is mathematics. This is some of the writing. You can actually learn the writing. One stroke represents one, or you have an arch here representing ten. So you can actually, if you um, see these uh, images, you actually can, can kind of figure out the writing. But nevertheless, uh, this is a very elaborate uh, system of writing and numbers that could be learned, but they were very sophisticated. So here is the oldest mathematical text. This text is not totally complete, but it's the oldest uh, mathematical writings in the history of the world that we have on papyrus or paper. It's called the Moscow Mathematical Papyrus. It has nothing to do with Moscow, other than the fact that that's where it was taken to. So that's how history is distorted. When people name documents based on who found it, or where it happens to be now. So there's no reason to call this the Moscow Mathematical Papyrus. Anyways, 3,800-year-old papyrus. Here are some of the writings. And this is, the, is a focus on calculating the volume of a cone or a pyramid. So a lot of the sophisticated algorithm, algorithms, uh, they have an origin. And they don't have an origin in Greece. We have it in uh, writing that's penned by ancient scribes. So the Moscow document is very important. But let me show you one that's even more popular or famous or perhaps even more important. It's a much more complete mathematical document. And this one here, this is a copy of a book. It's called the Rhind Mathematical Papyrus, an ancient Egyptian text. The only issue here is that Alexander Rhind purchased the document more than 3,000 years after it was written. So why is it now named after him? We actually know the name of the African scribe, Amos, who wrote the document. In fact, Amos made it very clear that he did not write these, these um, mathematical uh, equations and create them. He was simply copying them from a much older document because, uh, you know, at 1600 before the Common Era or 3,600 years ago, there was no copy machines, no fax machines, no scanners. So what did the scribes do? They copied by hand. And all Amos is simply saying is that he followed the instructions of the pharaoh to copy the document, the much older document, uh, by hand into the new document. And that's, that's why we have his name. He's not claiming to know, or, or the, he's not claiming to be the one who invented the knowledge. So here we have, with this document, 
87 advanced advanced mathematical problems without one single error. Trigonometry, calculus, geometry, arithmetic, not one single error. And uh, this is important to know. So we don't typically learn these things. You know, we have to come to a seminar like, seminar like this to to uh, to see the document. Anybody know where this document is, by the way? So it's not just general information. Okay, anybody name a famous or popular museum in um, in England? Which one? Brooklyn Museum. Which one? Okay, uh, okay, Brooklyn Museum is a good is a good uh, good try. Yes, you said the. The British Museum. I was going to say, uh, we, we're going to give you half credit because you said B for Brooklyn, but it's actually British Museum. But good try because the Brooklyn Museum, they do have a lot of material. So the British Museum, you're going to the British Museum. Okay, so second part of the test, what city is it in? British Museum? Okay, it's in London. All right, so you go to London. British Museum, second floor, you see the Rhine Mathematical Papyrus. Okay, so, uh, all right, so 87 advanced mathematical problems. This is how it starts off. Notice it's, it's uh, red. This is the beginning of the text. And then you have uh, black, and um, the problem is, is the word rind. So I think it's a good idea to get rid of the name because it's totally inaccurate. And why don't we call it what it should be called? And what do you think we should call it? Make it more accurate. Um, why not? Give almost credit for what he did. He copied it from an older document. And if we take a look at the beginning of the papyrus here, this is actually what it says. It's not simply math, but it's more, it's much more deeper than that. It says, as it starts off here, it's almost like a title of it. It says, an accurate method of, of counting for grasping the meaning of things and knowing everything that is, all mysteries and secrets. That's a bad document. <laughs> <laughs> and so this is how it starts off. So uh, very powerful. All right, so take a look at this. So we know that in, in California, every 10th grader, every 10th grader has to learn the so-called Pythagorean theorem which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. This is how it's always presented. It's presented in math classes, social studies, but we don't always go deeper. I do, but most people don't. So what do we know about Pythagoras? Remember the date I gave you for the document? We'll remind you in a minute. But Pythagoras lived about 500 before the Common Era. So there's already an issue here. Um, and the issue about Pythagoras is that there's no teachers. There's no teachers of geometry that Pythagoras could have uh, benefited from or learned from. There's no schools of geometry. There's no books of geometry in Greece, not one. And um, so where do you get this from? I'll, I'll give you the sources. So if you want to go check it out, we'll give you the sources. We know from a several Greek writers themselves that Pythagoras left Greece and went to Egypt, which is in Africa, and studied for 22 years under who? Priest. And that's where he learned geometry. Then he goes back to Greece teaching a subject that he didn't know when he left. And so documentation beats conversation. So let's give you the documentation because we can talk uh, about these things. But let's give you the, the, some of the evidence. Here's the Amos Papyrus. So this was written 1600. That's more than 1,000 years before Pythagoras' mother even knew him. So how in the world could the man create something that preexisted 1,000 years before he's around? And take a look, 87 lessons. And notice, this is a, a squared plus B squared. We're looking at it right here on the actual document. I told you where it was. You go to the British Museum, second floor. It's there. Or you can purchase the book, and you can get it there if you don't get a chance to go to London. So this so-called Pythagorean theorem has it's no basis in fact, so let's get rid of it. What should we call it? Why not call it what it should be called? It's the Amos theorem. Right? Is is logical? We're in a place where logic reigns. Does it logic reign and rule in, at Google? It's my assumption as a guest. <laughs> You're all employees. So <laughs> it is how. <laughs> what you say? I was copying it. Uh, yeah, but he copied it from his own people. So at least call it the almost slash ancient Egyptian theorem. You know, <laughs> at least that. But almost would not have claimed uh, ownership of it because the Africans didn't think that way. He only said that he was faithfully uh, following through on instructions to copy it. But uh, if you're going to pinpoint an individual, and here's the details. So that's why this is very, very important to look at the historical facts and not give credit where credit is not due. And uh, this system is very slow, but it should come up with the next slide. Okay, so anyway, here's the sources. 
So anyway, these are writers, Greek writers, who said the same thing, that Pythagoras, he goes to Egypt, he studies for 22 years under priests, and then he goes back teaching geometry. So these are the sources that document that Pythagoras was specifically learning mathematics under the priests. So here you go here. All right, so anyway, moving forward, uh, architecture. This all also represents uh, science. So here's another Afri classical African contribution. The first known uh, architect in the history of humanity, the one we know by name, is Imhotep. Here he is. The Greeks changed his name to Escalapius. So again, look at the ending. And uh, he's also the first known physician in the world as well. Uh, about 2800, almost 2800 BCE, uh, Imhotep. This is an image of him holding the scroll. And so uh, it's a lot of, so the Hippocratic Oath, uh, there's some people who call it the Imhotepian Oath. Because it's Imhotep who's the first known physician that we know by name. But I want to focus not on the medical part, but on his architectural contributions. This here is the first stone building in the history of the world. This here is called the Step Pyramid today. People then didn't call it the Step Pyramid, but somewhere around 2700 before the Common Era, you have this massive structure which is over 200 feet in height. And notice that people today call it a Step Pyramid because it looks like a series of steps or benches. So this is the first tier, you should see the damage. The second, third, fourth, fifth, so it's six different tiers. And this is the first stone building in the world. This is in the northern part of uh, Egypt the oldest surviving uh, building, very massive structure. And here you see it from uh, it's another image. But take a close look at this the image in the box. These are two people to give you an idea of the size of this massive monument, massive monument. So this is the first uh, superstructure, as some like to call it, uh, super building in the world, a first pyramid. Uh, and it definitely takes science. I want to show you the ones in Giza. But inside of this one, beautiful tile. So if you go to the Metropolitan Museum in New York, which is not that far from the Brooklyn Museum, you can see the beautiful tile. Or if you go to Egypt, you can see parts of the same tile. I can imagine this in his heyday. Beautiful turquoise. Uh, this is inside. There's many different images inside of the Step Pyramid. And it's built for Zoser. This is the king, the pharaoh, the ruler who commissioned the building of that pyramid that you just saw. Uh, he's got his, his beard, his locks, um, eyes were taken. This is part of the original skin color that you would see here. He would have a uh, symbols of authority in his hand. Those were broken off. But this is an image of Zoser, who commissioned the building of that pyramid you just saw. And here's another pyramid. And all these pyramids I'm showing you now, it they predate, they precede the first true pyramid. Because I noticed that on the History Channel, they're still interviewing Eric Von Donegan. This man wrote Chariot of the Gods decades ago. And they, Have you, any of you seen the Ancient Aliens series? Are you kidding me? So these people make us believe that they're aliens that, that left uh, Mars and they went to Africa to build pyramids. And then they ascended back up. Uh, that doesn't make any sense because there are numerous pyramids in the area, not just the ones in Giza. So when I take people on, on, the, uh, on, uh, on the educational tours, we look at the evolution of pyramid building. You can see how they went from the Step Pyramid to the Maidum Pyramid and then ultimately to the True Pyramid. So you can see that this is an indigenous local innovation. And it doesn't require some interplanetary travelers to, to, to come around and build for Africans what Africans supposedly couldn't build for themselves. This is a very steep angle. No one really knows, but sometimes in the old literature, people call this the collapse pyramid. Uh, it didn't collapse, uh, um, but w actually we don't know what happened. But this is a very steep angle here, and uh, here's a man to give you an idea of the size of this, but this would have been built in tiers as well. This is the second one built after the one in Giza. I'm sorry, in the one in... Uh, uh, Sakar, notice this here. There's a place called Dashur. And notice why people would call this today the Bent Pyramid. Notice the change in angle. So this would have been a very steep angle, but it's now kind of in the middle. They, they change it to a more gentler angle. Some think, one theory is that maybe the Maidum Pyramid so-called collapsed and the builders were concerned about the same fate of this pyramid and they changed the angle. 
Uh, that's plausible, but we don't really know. But nevertheless, we do know that this was built before the ones in Giza that supposedly the aliens built. Now, at the same place of Dashur, there's also the Red Pyramid. This is actually the first true pyramid ever built in the history of the world. This is uh, this one here is about. This is probably uh, this is right around 2600, 2700, uh, almost 2700 BCE. Here you have people that are walking up to enter into the pyramid. So if you don't really know where you are and you see an opening, that's always the north side because it has the north star. Uh, but this is the red pyramid. It's the first true pyramid. And if you walk up into the, uh, into the pyramid, um, you have to walk up a couple hundred feet and then descend. And so uh, inside of the red pyramid, uh, as they call it, you go down about 200 feet, and then there's a series of rooms inside of the actual uh, pyramid as you go down and you enter in from the stairs to this area. And then there's uh, three, corbel, uh, uh, three corbelled ceilings. So notice that there's, like they call them corbelled ceilings, notice that these 11 of these, um, the, part of the corbelled uh, ceiling, about 40 feet high. And this is graffiti here. But this is inside of the pyramid where they use large blocks of limestone. And this is inside the monument. This is indigenous African innovation and in architecture uh, inside of the Red Pyramid. So it had nothing to do with some people coming from Mars to do anything. It's unnecessary. We can go inside. There's a series of three chambers. This is the first chamber. Here's the third chamber. As you leave the second one, there's a lot of graffiti. You get an idea of when people broke into the pyramid looking for treasure. Somebody here made up a, a false year. Someone said 1276. No, no one broke in. This was 1800. This person tried to make his date earlier than the previous person, so I guess he thought his name could last longer. Who knows? This one is the third corporal ceiling, more than 50 feet in height. But anyway, let me move forward because I know time is moving, but I, I wanted to show you all of those. All those pyramids I showed you were, are all older than these. Yes, sir? What, what makes something the first true pyramid? Like what's a true pyramid? Um, anything that's a true triangle. Yes, a true triangular shape. So that's what we call a true pyramid. And you all know these, you've seen these, some of you might have traveled to Egypt, even if you haven't, I know you've seen these. So we're told with the ancient alien series on the History Channel that these interplanetary travelers came and somehow built the monument. It doesn't make any sense. I've shown you all of the, I showed you pyramids that were built in, uh, 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 in the process of, of, of coming to the first true pyramid, which we saw in Dashur. And then you have the pyramids of Khufu, Khafre, Menkara, these massive structures. And by the way, these are the original names. Can you imagine a monument equivalent to a 48-story skyscraper? So when people say the Great Pyramids, they mean the three big ones here. Or if they say the Great Pyramid, they, they mean the one built for Khufu. The Greeks changed his name to Cheops. But this is a massive structure. And then the one in the middle built for Khafre, 471 feet, and then Menkara. These are the three great pyramid builders of Giza. This is about 2600 BCE. And notice the smaller, I didn't say small, but simply smaller pyramids here. These are smaller, but they're still massive structure, structures. These are people here. You say, I don't really see them. That's the point I'm making. They're very insignificant. These two are people. You say, I really don't see them. That's my point. And but trust me, there are people over here somewhere as well. This is a vast area. So and and uh, so let's take a look here at um, the Great Pyramid, the one in the back, Khufu's Pyramid, uh, 2.3 million stones uh, put in place without mortar, without glue. And um, here you have people on uh, on camel, 2.3 million stones built over a 20-year period. You're talking about engineering and heavy transport. Uh, techniques. This is me in front of one of the blocks. The blocks weighed on average two point uh, uh, two and a half tons. On the inside, you have 15 ton uh, stones. And take a look here. So inside, you have every pyramid is different. Every pyramid is different. Different chambers, different rooms, uh, and that's what you have inside of the Great Pyramid here. Um, and if you take a close look, this is math. This is geometry on a sophisticated level. This is math demonstrated on an extraordinary level. This is all the Great Pyramid. There's three big ones that we just showed you, but this is the Great Pyramid of Khufu from different angles. 
look at this. This is a perfect triangle. And here you can see you got a triangle here, a one here. Here's one in the shade and one on the back side. So if you have four equilateral triangles, that gives you a perfect what? Square. This is math at a sophisticated level that stuns the world. And by the way, there's an old, pro there's an old proverb that people still use in Egypt today, that all the world fears time, but time itself fears the pyramids. These monuments were built for how long? For eternity. And you're looking at these, absolutely extraordinary. Um, and so these were not burials, by the way. No mummies found inside, no skeletons. There was never any attempt for a burial uh, in these monuments. These were astrological observatories. We know that because they, it helped them tell time of day. In fact, you could tell the time of day based on how the sun uh, casts a shadow on the monument. You can tell the time of day, season of the year. And so, let's see. So, for example, um, this is, uh, let's see, this is the north. This, this is the north side here. This is the south side. This would be west. This is, uh, I'm sorry, this is, uh, this is north-south. This is east here, sorry. And this is west on the left. So given that, this orientation that I've just mentioned, what time of day would it be? Morning, afternoon, would it be evening? It would be afternoon because the sun is on this side. The sun sets in the west, right? So its sun is setting on this side, so it's casting a shadow here on the east side. So this is clearly later in the day. But this, this is what helped them set their calendars, is by, um, by these monuments. So there's rituals and ceremonies, but they were not burials. It makes no sense for people to say that. But researchers don't know all the details, so they make up things. And by the way, when, when, when planes fly above, you get these kind of aerial shots that I'm uh, showing you. And uh, definitely based on science, if you take a look here, notice there's two big pyramids of Khufu, Khafre, Menkaraz. Notice it's a little bit offline. Why is it offline? Because it's consistent with, with the Orion star system. And the Orion system is what they actually used. Uh, let me go back here. But the Orion uh, star system is, is what they used. It's like as above, so below. So this is, this is deliberately set offline because it had to do with their astrology. If we had an opportunity to share with you more, I would. But I did a presentation at an international conference in Atlanta, and my presentation was on the, or, the, the, the origin and purpose of Nile Valley Pyramid Science, to look at the evolution of pyramid building, where the idea came from, and what was the deep science involved. But this clearly has to do with astrology and also astronomy as well. And by the, by the way, in the back you see the city of Cairo. And in fact, in that same area around the Great Pyramid, we find the oldest surviving asphalt in the history of the world. This whole area was paved with, asphalt, with asphalt. Talk about more than 4,600 years ago. Here are people, just to give you an idea of the asphalt that was in the area, a whole paved area. This is uh, pretty phenomenal, to say the least. This is an uh, image of Khufu. Um, this, now, this is in the Brooklyn Museum, this, uh, this image here. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> this is thought to be Khufu, the one who commissioned the building of the Great Pyramid that you just saw. Uh, this, is, uh, red, this is pink and red granite, kind of pinkish red. And now, nobody knows how the pyramids were built. No one knows. It's nothing more than speculation. The only evidence that we have, visual evidence, of how large stones were moved to this image here from the tomb of Jehuti Hotep. Here you have 172 men. Now, for every time you see someone here, it's actually representing four men. So if, you had a, if we had a great image of you, you can see it's a person behind a person behind. So these are four for every time you see someone, and they're pulling ropes. You've seen the different, the different lines of men. They're pulling a rope, and this rope is securing this huge statue of Jehuti Hotep found in his tomb. Notice this man is pouring some kind of liquid. Uh, it's, on, it's being pulled kind of on a sled. Why is he pull it, pull it, pouring the liquid? To reduce friction. And what is this man doing here, do you think? See, he's on the, the knees of the huge statue. He's kind of clapping. Any idea? He's 
Uh, he's helping. Yeah, he's helping in the sense of creating a rhythm. The work is a lot easier when you can sing and dance, and that's what's happening here. So he's creating a, a rhythm. And anyway, this is the only specific information we have on how they move. And by the way, the text says moving a colossus. This is the middle pyramid of Khafre. This was uh, complete with limestone, Tura limestone. This is how it was completed in the 18th, uh, in, the, in the 1800s. A man named Muhammad Ali from Turkey, he had his engineers climb up this pyramid and strip off the limestone. Now it's used for bridges and mosques around Cairo. That's why you don't see this completed now. And, um, but this is math at a very sophisticated level. So this is what we mean by a true pyramid. This is a triangular shape. There's something special about this shape. It really is. Um, and if you see, uh, this is Khafre, who commissioned the building of the middle pyramid. There is, um, and then the third of these big pyramids is Menkara and his wife. Notice the affection. You always show, there's always affection between husband and wife. Her name looks difficult, but no, not if you break it into syllables. Ka, Mer, Er, Nepti. And notice this is a beautiful image. Notice the left foot forward. This is classic. Um, and so anyway, um, so these are these great pyramid builders. This is Menkara's middle pyramid. And this is math at a very sophisticated level. And this is the whole area here. It wasn't built by slaves and nothing to do with slavery. These were African astronomers, African astronomer, uh, 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 um, astrologers, blue-collar workers, managers, scientists who created these monuments to last for eternity. eternity. So these are the three great pyramids. And this is the place today where a person can go uh, and see the evidence of the uh, city of the ancient pyramid builders because their tombs are right in the area near these monuments here. And so um, that's what you see in Giza, uh, these great monuments. And uh, on the back of the dollar bill, you can see the uh, African influence there. There is, uh, there is this uh, Latin term, he has favored our undertaking. He have other uh, Latin inscription, new order of the ages. But which are the ones that relate to Egypt? You might ask. Well, the one I mentioned to you, the Eye of Heru. Here it is. This is not. And by the way, many of the uh, when, many of the presidents of the country were stonemasons, including the first president, George Washington. So it's not odd that they would look towards Egypt for guidance and symbolism. So many of them were masons, including the first president himself. And then not only the Eye, all seen Eye of Heru, but you have the pyramid. They didn't get these symbols from Greece, Rome, or any other place. These are pyramid, uh, symbols from Egypt, so you have a lot of the influence there. Um, you know, these are not only Masonic symbols, but this is science. Take a look at these ma this massive structure here. Uh, this is uh, Ramsey's image, and you don't see anybody here, but uh, if you look closely, now you do. Look at the size. It's 65 foot foot high monuments. And this temple was carved from the mountain behind it. Each one of these are Ramses. He's the greatest builder in the history of, uh, of Africa. And here is standing right underneath Ramses. And let me show you the science involved here. This is why I'm showing you this. Here's one of his sons of uh, Ramses. What a builder. This is about um, 3,200 years ago. Can you imagine? Now this is inside of the temple. Ramses is given his crown as the king and then inside of the temple, if you go through a series of rooms, about 180 feet back in the, into the inner sanctuary, the sun creeps in and lights up the statues in the back only twice a year. This is science at its best. So there's a mad rush usually on February the 22nd and October the 22nd, early morning, 4 a.m., people go to Abu Simbel to see one of the great phenomena in the world where the scientists were able to orient the temple that the sun creeps in 180 feet and into the back of the temple and lights up these four statues only twice a year. That's science because the sun, it shines off of the Nile and it, it lights up these statues early morning. People go to Abu Simbel, they spend the night to see one of the great phenomena. But can you imagine the, the knowledge of astrology to be able to do that and to orient the temple in exactly that way? So this is one of the great structures in the world. Let me show you the Karnak Temple here. Um, 
in Karnak, you see this is the sacred lake. This is part of the... T- Anybody see any structures here that might be familiar to us? Obelisk. Okay, obelisk, and they're, they're where? On the right. Okay, very good. Here's one. Here's the other one. So, okay, notice this. So here you have obelisk uh, at the Karnak Temple. Here are two. This one is built by Hatshepsut, Queen Hatshepsut. This is 97 feet, estimated 320 tons. Made out of one single block of granite. Here's another one here, a third one. But take a look here. Uh, this is the uh, the Tekken, or what people now call the obelisk, 1500 before the Common Era, or 3,500 years ago. Looks similar. This is the Washington Mo- Monument. Notice the reflecting pool. And this was built for George Washington, but, but if you take a look at the dates, this is in 1884. This is thousands of years later. George Washington and others, as we said a minute ago, they were Masons. So this is why we get this, um, this image. So you have the original and you have a copy. Could there be any uh, coincidence? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So most people don't connect this great U.S. monument to an African source. But that's the reality of it. You see it right there. And um, let me just end by showing you. So the science, we could say more. But uh, just in case somebody say, ah, science is good, but why do you connect it to Africa? Okay, well, let's address that issue here uh, whenever this comes up. This is the greatest statue on earth, the most well-known, the most famous statue in the history of the world. You know it as the Great Sphinx. The original name is Haru M. Akit or the god Haru in the horizon. Notice that it's in Giza. So this is the uh, Great Pyramid of Khufu. This is the one in the middle. If you go down the hill, here's this monument here. Here you can see it. It's down the hill. This is a man. To give you an idea, this is a 66-foot high monument. As you can see, it has the head of a person and uh, the body of a lion, 240 feet long. This is the greatest and most well-known statue on earth. But I'm showing you this because most times you see the front view where obviously there's deliberate nose damage. Some people think uh, Napoleon trained his cannons to blow it off. I think not. That would have been a heck of a cannon shot. I think more likely they sawed it off, but not Napoleon. The the nose was missing long before Napoleon in around 1799, long before that. But what we don't often see is the profile view. You don't often see the Africoid profile view. Because even with the nose missing, notice the cheekbones, notice, oh, oh there they go, the, notice the juicy uh, kissing lips. These lips are meant for smooching and infection. And this is a, clearly an Africoid image, but you don't normally see the profile view, but here it is. That's it. And so um, I have many other images of this, but that one you can see, so the most well-known statue in the world, you see it, this Africoid. And it's the reason why people don't often get a chance to see the profile view, because how do you explain this? Um, All right, let me show you other images. If that's not enough for you, all the tough audience, so let's show you some other images. The tomb of Kajimni. Most people don't go there, but I take every group to Kajimni's tomb. And this is a tomb that's around the time of Patalatep. You have noticed the color is off here on the projector, but this is uh, more reddish than brown here. But you have different color images when they wanted to juxtapose one person to another. Uh, and, and, but they did notice they didn't use any l- really light colors. Now, on the tomb of Ramses III, I want, this is the King's Valley Tomb Number 11. That's what KV stands for. And this is about 1200 BCE or 3200 years ago. What do you notice here? Notice you see person A and what else? Person C. Notice this. This is interesting because they're dressed, they're jet black and dressed identical. And this is actually in the tomb of Ramses III. This is how the artists depicted themselves. This, is, this says here, Ramesh, or it just means people. I mean, it just means the people of Egypt. This here says uh, uh, um, Nehesi. Nehesi just means those to the south. So it's interesting that the people in Egypt, the artists in this case, in a royal tomb. So this is not some side artist. This is a royally trained artist depicted the people in Egypt jet black and identical to other Africans from the south. And um, so KV-11, if you get a chance to go, you want to check that out. And you can see. But not only that, but there's other uh, things too. This is, someone said, well, those images don't exist. I said, are you kidding me? 
this is inside of the tomb itself, and you still have the same black skin images. So KV11. Um, uh, what do you think this is? I want to end by just showing you a couple slides, and I'll, I'm done. I just want to show you the identity. What do you think this is? Comb. What kind of comb? Yes, <laughs> yes, it's a pick, Afro pick, and uh, here. Uh, sometimes the teeth are broken, you know, in the old days, you know, people. <laughs> so just if you look at one line of evidence, you can indicate the identity. Sometimes people say, yes, I agree it's a high culture, but I don't think it has anything to do with Africans. Well, let's uh, address that issue. So you have just if you just look at combs and hair, we can address that as we close. Here's uh, Sister Hanut. What is she doing? She is braiding hair. This is the hieroglyphic image for just that braiding hair. This is an African hairstyle. People often say, I love your French braids. Uh, well, it actually doesn't have anything to do with the French. It's an African hairstyle. It goes back many thousands of years, as you see here. Um, take a look at this beautiful image of a princess. Notice she has her jewelry, a bouquet, the almond-shaped eyes. And yes, you have the beautiful braided hair and a linen outfit. Because people wear linen a lot when it's very hot. But not only that, take a look at Queen Thepu. Notice the beautiful skin tone, the jewelry, almond-shaped eyes. Uh, and they they wore wigs sometimes. Uh, this is more likely her hair, but when they did wear wigs, it is always human hair. And notice how beautiful it is here. Um, not only that, but you can look at other images here. This one is a wig here, but it's... Almost Nefertari, she's always depicted uh, in this manner. Notice her symbols of authority. This is her name. She's a high-level queen, but the wigs are always human hair. But not only that, but take a look at how kings are represented. This is a Minimat the third, and so uh, running the nation. He was a king of the 12th dynasty. He has on locks here, very powerful. And so tell Rasta that we appreciate the culture, but the Rasta didn't, Rasta didn't originate the dreads. You see him right here. Uh, this is in the Cairo Museum, Amenemhat III, a very powerful ruler uh, who ruled during a very important time period. This is the, the uh, image of the first known dentist in the history of humanity, the first known dentist by name, Hesse Ray. And notice he had, this is not a wig. This is his hair. This is his fro. And you know, Hesse Ray, when you go into the Cairo Museum, do you know he is off to the side? The, most of the guys walk right past Hesse Ray. And, you, and, um, and unless the person is curious, they have to actually go kind of behind a little area to look at the Hesse Ray paintings. There's six of these that have been found from his tomb, Third Dynasty. This is about 2800 B.C. It's the first known dentist that we know of by name in the history of the world. And his, his, uh, notice the helical structure of the hair. This is a, clearly an Africoid image. Let me just, there's a couple more images here. Um, you have wigs in the Cairo Museum, worn by priests. Notice these Afro wigs. Notice um, even the dolls they played with, even the beads representing what? Braided hair. Um, just one line of evidence here, just hair, combs. And uh, this is, I mean, in here is King Tut. He's a statue in his tomb. This is original, uh, okay, uh, original uh, golden mass of Tutankhamen, gold found on his mummy about 3,300 inches. Anybody go to the King Tut exhibit at the De Young? You see it? Yes. And so uh, you went to the, so this is Tutankhamen. This is his mother, Queen T. Now, if the new DNA tests are correct, and we don't know that they are, but if they are, that instead of his mother, this would be his grandmother. Either way, it's still all in the family, Africoid family. I'm just showing you someone that everybody is familiar with. This is if this is not his father, I'm in Hotel the Third. It would be his grandfather, still all in the family. And then uh, this is Tutankhamen, original images of him. And then finally, uh, this is what was in the exhibit. You might recall this image of Tutankhamen. This is like a, a mannequin. And um, of Tutankhamen, and finally, this is uh, just a brief, very brief information that I wanted to share with you about uh, African contributions in math and science. And uh, thank you very much. I'm Professor Maynu Empire. Thank you very much.
Did anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you said a couple of times, you know, this is the first book or the first stone building. When you, when you say that, do you mean like this is the first one we know of, or we actually have, you know, people are saying, oh, this literally is the first time anybody's seen this. We have historical record of that this was created, the first creation. The first we know of, yes. Yeah, first we know of. And that, that that's how I typically try to explain it. But yeah, good, good, good. First we know of. It's like, because, uh, you know, like, for example, when we see um, Imhotep is the first known architect, but it just pops up and is a great building, so we have to assume there has to be some period before that. Yeah, we just don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. With this... Yeah, uh, yeah. This is uh, this, as you can see, is, is uh, it's um, um, the pixelated and you know, the colors are all off. So, but but outside of that, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, and I, I just wanted to say that so the colors are off of what you're seeing here. I don't know what's going on, but anyway, um, people would like to say this is uh, this is style. Uh, this is stylized. In other words, it's. Is stylized or idealized is not really how the people looked. And so people like to, uh, actually, if you take a look at, maybe it's my eyes, that one looks closer to the original here. It's not just me, is it? That, that, that looks different. Yeah, uh, this is more authentic. I should have been, <laughs> we should have turned around. I should have walked to the back. So that's more accurate. But, but, but that argument that, oh, the people were depicted that way, that is idealized, no. Because uh, if you've seen one image of Tutankhamun, you can tell, if, if we had a collage of different images, you would always be able to pick him out. Because these um, people who try to say they idealize that people didn't look like that, no. Um, you can see specifically in the paintings and the sculpture, it's exactly how they look. Mummies have been found. They've been depicted by other groups as well. It's very consistent. People try to get around that because they would like the public to think that this had nothing to do with Africa and these dark um, skin images are really not the reality. So now what people have tried to do is use forensic art to come up with some brand new images of how the people looked. And it's not necessary to do that because we have from his tomb, for example, there's more than 5,000 items. And most of them have images of Tutankhamun. And they're very, very consistent, not only from his tomb, but... Um, from um, other images of him as well. So, so the, I, this argument that this is idealized and they just happen to look African is really not. That, that was a real word. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. You might be. Well, let me show you too. I think you might be talking about the Table of Nations. This is the one on Kush. You're not talking about that one, right? Yeah. No, that could be a good one. Yeah. Okay. If we use this one, this is exactly how the people look. Exactly. In fact, if anybody goes to Sudan today, where the heartland of Kush, people look exactly like that. There's very shades of brown. There is uh, like the black color. Um, it's very shades of black. There's chocolate. There's a uh, gray, black, blue, uh, a blue, black, super black, wild black, amazing black, perfect black. I mean, in oh, Sudan, right it's, it's much better. Yeah, that's it's, it's much, much better there. But that's exactly how. So when I first went to Sudan, um, I really didn't know what to expect. So it makes sense to me. And, 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 and besides, the people who named the place uh, Bilad El Sudan, that's an Arab phrase, mean land of the blacks. That's literally what it means. Even the term Ethiopia, uh, it's a Greek term which means burnt face, black face, or kissed by the sun. So those images that you actually see are very accurate. The people in Sudan and, and, uh, and Nubians, Nubians are in southern Egypt and northern Sudan. You can see that those variations even today. And not only that, but the other one um, that you mentioned 
They're very specific. They're, 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 they're very specific. The artists were very, very detailed in how they portrayed things, um, not only people, but they're so specific. You can see the species of plants, the species of fish, because they're very, very detailed in how they present. So here, um, when you see the, well, there's better, but how do people dress their attire, the details, their beards, all these things are very accurate. And this is how we're able to tell not only from the inscriptions, but the but how they are depicted. So they really didn't, they, um, they were not loose with how they portrayed people. But some have said that uh, these are just generalized. They're not generalized. They're very specific. And that's why if a person goes to a museum, they can see that in many cases, um, you go to different museums, there's no name of the person. And the location, it will say prominence unknown. In other words, they're assuming that this statue represents their person because of the stylistic specific, uh, stylistic details. And because of that, they say it must be this person. You'll see that many times, that presumed to be king such and such, and they say provenance unknown because they don't know. They bought it from somebody. And how could they assume who it is if they all look alike? Or No, it's very specific. And you can see the, the variations of skin tone, dress, and uh, so that's a whole other argument. That's actually a great question, though. It really is. Yes, sir. Uh, you said no one knows uh, how the pyramids were constructed. Uh, does anyone also sense that um, it wasn't constructed by slaves? Is there evidence one way or the other? Oh, yeah. There's, there's clear evidence that it was not constructed by slaves. And uh, let me show you here a uh, good question. Let me show you this place here. I took out a lot of slides, but um, this place here, uh, Nazlet El Simon. In this location here, as of 1992, the the Giza mapping project led by Mark Lehner, we now know um, the tombs have been found of the actual pyramid builders. We know their titles, what days they worked, what days they had off. So they would work seven days and then have three days off. That was a week. So a week was a was a 10-day period. So there were three 10-day weeks. They worked seven days, three days off. Worked seven days, three days off. Worked seven days, three days off. We know that they were paid with grains of wheat, grains of barley, and with linen cloth. So the records are very clear that these were paid laborers, that no one was involved in forced labor. So the place of Nazareth El Simon since 91, actually 90, since 92, now the slavery argument, it has no, um, no weight. Before that, people argued it without evidence. Now... The argument can't be advanced anymore because of the evidence um, at Nazareth El Simon and knowing when people were paid and how they were paid. Yeah. And there's, so there's evidence for like, all the different positions. Yes. So that, actually, on that slide, uh, they depicted the different positions. There were people pulling the sled, and there was the linen keeper, and there was other positions. So there's evidence that all the positions were paid. Yeah, absolutely. So you have evidence of because they're the tomb. Because uh, when somebody has a tomb, the tomb is um, the person's like like any um, like a tombstone today. It would have the person's name when they were born, when they passed away. But there's a, a big tomb would in, indicate all their life achievements, but also their titles, their titles, their family members. So we know their titles, what they uh, claim to have accomplished in their life, and you see that at that location there. There's uh, what's been found um, is the bakery, the brewery, the tombs. Uh, their titles, so they're all laid out, and not only their titles, but also how the um, how the, the they call it a za, or people translate it as a gang, not a gang of thugs, but a gang of workers. <laughs> how they were organized to do the work. So usually they would work in three month shifts, then they would go back into their communities. So that it was a public works project built by African stonemasons, and in fact it was. Um, Communal, cooperative, and collective public works projects and had nothing to do with slavery. But those tombs and the titles and how and when people were paid, that sealed the case. Um, 92. Yes, it was. And if you look up Mark Lehner, yeah, they, they had. So Mark Lehner's got these theories of how the pyramids are built. And um, so this is when the Discovery Channel showed it. They had a bunch of men like pulling these stones. They wanted to see how to build a miniature pyramid. So the camera showed the men, hee-haw, hee, 
feet. And so they pull in the stone. So they show, they show the men and the ropes. And then when I went to Egypt a few months later, <laughs> I learned that what they didn't show was the tractor that was really pulling the stone. <laughs> so this is a joke. But nevertheless, that was because they did find the evidence of the uh, of the actual pyramid builders. Now, uh, as I said, that argument really doesn't have any weight anymore. But if you look up Mark Lehner, you can um, you can you can actually see some of their evidence because he's the one that's really over the site now, Mark um, Lehner. So that really dispels the slavery argument. It's almost, uh, they still were slaves, right? But so it's considered more respectful position that. Slaves. That, no, no say so that. Okay, this, the slave idea comes from two sources, from from the biblical idea and then some of the later Greek writers who had no idea how they were built, so they made up a lot of stories. So many people think that there were slaves uh, in the Bible who built pyramids. The problem is the very first Hebrew was Abraham. Abraham was dated to about 1600 or 1650 BCE. The problem is is that that's a thousand years after these were built. So how could Abraham leap through history a thousand years in, uh, before him and build pyramids? So there's no evidence of any slaves whatsoever. What you do see, though, is that when Egypt went, when, when other nations tried to invade Egypt, you do see captives. You, you see prisoners of war, but you never see them being employed into any kind of labor. So you see that. You see bound captives. And then the Greeks came around and made up a lot of stories. Herodotus is a very good source for the Greek myths. Like, for example, Herodotus is saying that Herodotus is a good source because he reports what he saw in, at the time in 500 BC and he reports what he heard. And so Herodotus relays myths. He said, look, uh, I'm just going to say what the Greeks say. So according to the Greek mythology, Khufu, um, those, those smaller pyramids were built because Khufu's daughter supposedly was involved with prostitution and for every man that she slept with she asked that they bring a stone and <laughs> incredible and that this is how the, the monument was built first of all there's no evidence of this this is silly this is the king's daughter he has tons of wealth so why would she need to engage in that but it almost seems like Herodotus is half embarrassed by reporting this but this is the Greek the Greeks made up stories for things they didn't understand but those are the two sources and of course uh, the, the Ten Commandments and and all these other things that have come out over the years, this is what has presented to the public that there is slavery. But there is no slavery whatsoever. I didn't say that they were perfect. I said there's no slavery. Because all we do see is that we see captives that are that are bound in warfare. But there's nobody employed. There's no text. There's no images of it. But the idea of slaves building a pyramid, that's been in the public mind for a while. And then when the evidence was found in Nazareth Summit, and you had people writing about slavery... They had to say, oh, the evidence is there. We better back up. So they backed away from those those claims. But a lot of the specialists were the ones promoting the slavery idea. So that's um, that's where we are. And if we had time, I would really show you the evidence from here. I didn't include these slides because it's interesting when you actually see the evidence of the actual um, workers and the city that they worked in and how they were paid. You can see it. It shows you. So... Um, any other? But well, thank you for your time, folks. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I can give you guys a lot.